everyone here this evening. If you would join us in the sanctuary, we're going to go and get started. Stand with me, turn to page 198, Joy Unspeakable and Full of Glory, page 198. As you guys all know, Pastor is on vacation, enjoying his camping trip. I'm pretty sure they've already taken pictures, so if you go to a Facebook page, I'm sure you'll see some pictures up there already. I'm trying to think of the announcements. Men's prayer this Saturday, right? Okay, men's prayer this Saturday. Come on out for that. Is that 7? Yes. I always forget when I come up here. Every single announcement just leaves your head. Now I know how Pastor feels. It's terrible. Um, also coming up is teen camp. I know some of you guys have some teens that will be going away on that. It will be a great time for them. And then at the end of June, VBS time is upon us. So prepare yourselves. Be praying for it now. You guys all know the drill. We're going to get ready to start building some things, prepping some things, and getting your roles assigned. And um, I think that's about it. And I'm realizing we have not opened up in prayer. So Brother George... Can you open us up in prayer tonight? Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, thank you for your love and your patience, Lord, and your kindness. Um, please uh, bless the preacher today. Give him words to say, Lord. Help us to um, help us to know you better, Lord. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. So, yeah. I think, Brother Stephen, this is the last time for the memory verse, correct? And then we get a brand new one. Oh, man. Is it going to be a nice and short one, or are we going to do like a whole psalm? I think we should do Psalm 119. Let's, make, let's really go for it. <laughs> yeah, come on up. Yeah, that'll keep us preoccupied for the next few years, I think. <laughs> psalm 103. Turn there with me real quick. We've been looking at verses 1 and 2, Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, and if you are there, if you could read that along with me nice and loud, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So there it is. That's been our verse. Anybody left, hasn't gone yet, wants to give it a shot tonight, feel free. No, 
That's all right. Good job on that one this month, guys. Jeremy? Psalm 119, that would be quite the memory verse of a month, I'll tell you. Um, that would take a little bit of dedication on that part. But uh, I've been enjoying these psalms, and that, that one there, I love that one. It's a nice, familiar portion, but that first verse kind of repeats itself throughout Scripture over and over again, so you want to make sure you don't get hung up. But I think everyone's kind of gotten that. It sounds like everyone's done pretty well with it. Um, yeah, we're going to sing page number 200 now. He's a wonderful Savior to me. If you would stand with me, page 200. <clears throat> Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We are starting off in the Hall of Faith. Now, I'm going to tell Derek, you're good. We're not doing minor prophets tonight. It's always a running joke when I'm preaching that I love to do minor prophets, and it's, he's never ready for those. They're not already set up in the system for him. But I love to watch him scramble, because when I'm back there, I feel like I'm scrambling all the time. But um, we're going to be starting off in Hebrews chapter 11, and then we're going to jump to the book of Judges. So <clears throat> we're, we're all pretty much familiar with uh, chapter 11. It's the, the hall of faith, as I call it. And you, you have a lot of names mentioned. And when I was looking at what, I, what to talk about this evening... I wanted to focus on some of the lesser mentioned ones. I mean, we have these big names we're all familiar with, Moses, Noah, Abraham. But if you, starting in verse 32, it starts to go into the little, little bit more here. And it says, and what shall I say more? Oh, wow. Whew. It's going to be one of those evenings. I can't speak tonight. Apologize in advance. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, 
quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword out of weakness, were made strong, wax valiant and fight, turn to flight the armies of the aliens. And it just continues, but we're going to stop there. And I wanted to focus on some of these names that are just mentioned here in passing. And, and he says it pretty much. What else can I say? There's so many more names that could have been added to the Hall of Faith. And he just quickly lists some of them, but we, we often like just kind of scan over there. We're so focused on the big names when we're looking at this, like, oh, look at the faith of these people. But you look at this, I mean, Samson, Jephthah, Jephthah, and Barak are names that sometimes you might not even remember when you're looking through. Like, who are they? Who are they? Well, they're, they're in the book of Judges. And Barak is actually the one I want to talk about tonight. But uh, Barak has a controversial part here. Because in this little scripture here, you have Gideon, Jephthah, Samson, Samuel. These are all judges. Now, you talk about Barak. Technically, Barak wasn't the judge. It was Deborah. Deborah was the, mentioned as being the judge. Barak is right there with her. A lot of people will give Barak that judge status. But he's not the one that's mentioned directly in Scripture saying judging. It's Deborah. And then, so you have to start questioning, okay, so Deborah been the one in this verse instead of Barak? Now, Deborah was a great woman of faith, a great judge, a prophetess. But I doubt that this was a mistake. Barak's name is here for a reason, and that's why I wanted to talk about him tonight. So let's pray, and then we'll talk about this man, Barak. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this evening, Lord, that we can come together in your house, Lord, and just study your scriptures, Lord. And Lord, I just ask that you bless this evening, Lord. Be with this message, Lord. Let it be your words, not mine, and just allow it to be a blessing to the congregation, Lord. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So... If you go with me to Judges chapter 4, this is where we'll get into Barak. And like most of the people mentioned in the book of Judges, he is not some well-known person. He doesn't have this high standing. He's honestly just kind of, they mention his father and where he's from, and that's it. And his father's not mentioned anywhere else in scripture. He's mentioned just here and then a couple of other scriptures just briefly stating what he did. So he's not really anyone that special, but let's look at why he was needed, why that faith was needed. And like I said, we're in the book of Judges, chapter 4. It's a familiar book, right? It's literally just on a loop. The children of Israel sinned. They go into captivity. There raids the judge, someone who brings them out of that. There's a time of peace, and then we go right back to sin. And it just continues. It's, it's honestly heartbreaking going through the book of Judges, just knowing that that is man's nature. That is just how it is sometimes. I mean, we, we go through the same things. We have that moment where we're struggling. We're going to the Lord, please, Lord, deliver me. We have that time where we're faithful and just so, so dedicated to God. And then we start getting ah, this peaceful time. I can start focusing on these things pull my attention over away, and we just start going away from God, falling back into sin, and going back to him. It's such a sad state. But here we have God, who has all this knowing everything that's going to happen, bringing about Deborah, and like I said, Barak, to be one of these, or two of these people that will help bring the nation back into a time of peace. So we'll start at verse 1, just to talk about what's going on, why he needed to be around. And it says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Ehud's a great story, a real win for left-handed people to just stick it to the governor, stick it to the man if you want. But it, it was a great story. Definitely a bedtime story if you want to tell it to the kids. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Harosheth of the Gentiles. 
And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Bathadot, she judged Israel at that time. Like I said, they specifically mentions her being the judge here. But here she is the one who calls for a barrack. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel, and Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinonah, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Have not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun? So, like I said, Deborah is the one who calls to him. God put Deborah there. Deborah calls Barak, and Barak is the one who was going to lead this 10,000 men. But th- that's, th- this is all the information you're given about Barak. There's his dad, there's a tribe of Naphtali, that's where he's, his tribe, that's where he's from. And he is told, uh, okay, God is calling you to get 10,000 men of your brethren of Naphtali and your neighboring tribe, Zebulun. And you're going to go lead this battle. We see no history of him being a leader, a commander, or anything in the military. Maybe he was. We just don't have that information. It seems like he's just some regular person who is literally told, hey, it's your turn. Gather 10,000 men, and we're going to go and get you guys out of captivity. And it's... Quite the daunting task. I, I don't know how I would react if I was just randomly called saying, hey, yeah. go gather 10,000 people. Yeah. We're going to, you know those people that are pressing you, your slaves too? It's time to kick them out. Let's go. And I can't imagine him. Okay, how do I go talk to the brethren? How do I go convince 10,000 people that the people who are owners of us, the people who have persecuted us and beaten us. We're, I want you guys to follow me. I'm a nobody. I have nothing. I'm not the judge. The judge sent me. God sent the judge. So by God, I'm here. So are you guys with me? I would fail at that speech. I may be getting two people, and that's probably people in my family. But I, I, I just love that how God uses people of no status, no renown, because it's an encouragement to all of us. We, we don't have to be anyone special. Right. You're a child of God. You can be used. And, and it's a daunting task. And Barak gets a lot, a lot of flack from people when they're studying the Bible. Because we're continue, you're going to see there's a controversial thing that he does. Well, we already mentioned the controversy of him being mentioned with the other judges in the Hall of Faith, but... There's even more controversy here because he is told to go. And in verse 8, really hammers home why the controversy is there. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. So much. People look at him like, oh, that's a coward. Again, you just got told to go to war with people. You're not a soldier. The people you're recruiting are not soldiers. And I mentioned that he's going against the army. 900 chariots of iron. That's not good, that's not a good odds there. But we're so quick to judge because we're just reading it. We're just not there. We're not experiencing it. We're calling a man who was just told, go and fight this battle. And looking like, oh, coward, lack of faith not believing. And, you know, at first when I read this, that's what I felt. But as I'm looking at this, if I'm, you know, picturing what's really going on, my mindset really changes here. Because is what he's doing not something I would do? Is what he's asking not uh, something that's pretty natural to do? You want me to go? Okay, I need you to come with me. And he is far from the only one who has done something like that. Because I'm sure there's one big name we can all think of who said, 
uh, I, I'm not the one. I, I need you to come with me. Yeah. I mean, when you get that call, it is daunting. It is never easy just to answer the call of God. It sounds easy, but it's not easy. Even the simplest things, when you're called of God and you're put in that moment, you're just, whew. all right, brother, you've been a member of our church for a while. I want you to go preach at the nursing home. Okay. I want you to go teach downstairs to the little ones. I want you to come preach up here on camera. Getting YouTube and Facebook famous. You guys ready to be on camera? You ready to be out there? Really let your faith shine? It's a big thing when you're first asked that in the moment, isn't it? And here he is. If you will go, I'll go. Now, I can tell you when Moses got, first got called, what was his response? Oh, I can't talk. No, I can't do this. I can't do that. And God said, your brother Aaron's coming. Now, that's Moses, one of the big names of faith, right? And even he had doubts when he first got that call. Would you call that weakness? I want it. You think when Israel went to battle and they made this huge mistake saying, bring the Ark of the Covenant. Why do they want the Ark of the Covenant? Well, let's, let's look at that. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 4. Because this was a bad call, this decision that was made. But the reasoning for the decision, I completely understand. Now, this is when Samuel is coming up. And there's uh, these two brothers that he was put under that uh, they, they weren't the best. They kind of pushed people out of God's temple. But we, he, we see here, chapter 4, 1 Samuel 4, and I'll start in verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. The mentality is, again, terrible decision, but the mentality is, we lost this battle because the Lord wasn't with us. If we bring the ark over here, the Lord is with us, we will win this. So despite being a completely wrong decision, they still had this mentality, if God is here with us, we'll win. Isn't that interesting? These people who were far from God at this time, especially Hophni and Phinehas, far from God, and yet the, 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 the mentality is, God will deliver us from this if we bring them here with us. Now, we know it didn't work out that way. They, they, although, at first, it kind of did. Because when they start celebrating once the ark is there. They're making this loud noise. And even the Philistines like, whoa, the ark of the covenant's there? Their Lord is with them? Whoa. They, they, they know the track record when the Lord is with them. It's not a good standing. So even the Philistines at first were like, Ooh, this might, this might be a bad decision. We might need to hold off. But, of course, the Philistines won, won that battle. They took the Ark of the Covenant. A lot, of, a lot of wrong goes on before they return it. But, like I said, I understand the mentality. You're, you're put in this hopeless situation, and your first thought is, I need Lord God here with me. They went about it wrong, and it wasn't the right way. When Moses was called and he said, I need, I need someone else with me. It wasn't the right way, but it's understanding. Two negative examples. But when, when you're put in this situation, you want help. I can think of even the minorest of things where I'm told, hey, I need you to go do this. And I'm like, who else is coming? Anyone else doing this? I remember one time, pastor was like, hey, we're going to go knock on some doors. Ha, ah, who else is coming? That's my first thought. Who else is coming? Can I get away with just being a silent partner? Can I just stand there? Yep. You, you should definitely come to church. Uh, did you get our track? Yep. 
Okay? Let someone else come. Let someone with well-spoken handle that. Brother Stephen, look at you. We need you to go do that. <laughs> but it, it's just that quick moment you're like, I, I want someone else here with me. I want that person I know I can trust that will handle this. But here we are, back in Judges, where we're just looking at him, thinking, that wasn't the right move. That's wrong. It's like a doubt. What, you won't go unless someone else goes with you? Where's your faith? Is it lacking? And I honestly had to really think about this. Is there another time in the Bible where someone said, I will not go without you, and it was the right decision? Is there one right time in there? There is. There's probably more than one, and I just don't see them all. But I picked on Moses earlier. Let's show when Moses did it correctly. Go with me to Exodus chapter 33. Because I can draw this pretty much being the exact parallel. Mo Moses was already leading. He was already doing what God wanted him to do. He was delivering the people. Now, of course, we know the book of Exodus. The people constantly messed up. And the Lord is at that point where he's upset. And he makes this statement. Exodus 33, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt. You know it's bad when he says, Moses, you brought these people up. He, he's not even claiming them at this point. Unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. He says, I will send the angel out before you. Sounds great, right? God's angel? You can't lose that battle. God, God is there. But Moses, Moses said no. Moses knew that the current situation was not the right situation. Drop down to verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Again, who, who's coming with me? Who's helping me here? Now, he just got told the angel, the, the angel will call before him. But he's saying, who will come with me? Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us up, not up hence. God, if you are not there with me, I am not going. Don't send me. Now, what is, what is Barak doing? He's saying to Deborah, If you're not coming with me, I'm not going. Now, is that weakness? I'm sure a lot of people will judge him for weakness. Especially in that time, he's asking a woman of all things, I need you to come with me. Really looks like weakness to a lot of people there. That, who was Deborah? Who was she? She was a prophetess and she was a judge. She was being directly used by God. And he is saying, I will not go unless I know you're there with me. Because if you're there with me, that means God is there. That means God is in this. That means God is in control and this battle is winnable. Because if God's not in there, there's no way we are winning this battle. Not in the slightest. 10,000 unexperienced people trying to fight an army with 900 iron chariots. Nope. If you're not coming, I'm not going. Because I know, I know we cannot win this without God. This is how I started picturing it. Because this man knew what he was doing. Again, he's in the hall of faith. He is directly mentioned in Hebrews 11 for his faith. Is that a lack of faith that he wanted to make sure God's there with him? Is that a lack of faith? And Deborah, 
not thrown off about this in the slightest. Back in Judges 4, when she's thrown this question, if you're not going, I'm not going. She said, I'll surely go with thee. There's no rebuke there, is there? She, she's like, whoa, no, that's a bad, you're going against God. So like, yeah, I'll go with you. Now, there's a little penalty there, sure. Notwithstanding, the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Syria into the hand of a woman. Okay. I'll tell you right now, I can live with that. You're saying if you go with me and God's win this and we're going to win this battle, I'm not getting the honor? Good. I'm not supposed to get the honor anyways, am I? Is that really a punishment to be told you're not the one getting honor for winning this battle? A battle you know you can't win without God. I don't, I don't see that as a punishment. If anything, I would say it's more of an embarrassment for Sisera who's going to lose the battle to a woman. That's how he's going to have his life taken. He would be looked at as very embarrassed dying that way in that time. And it wasn't even in battle, as we'll get to later in the story. He, he just kind of dies pathetically in his sleep. After a warm cup of milk and he went to bed thinking he's safe and he died. That's more embarrassing for him than for me to say a woman killed him. I won the battle. Did I kill him? No. I'm not embarrassed by that. I don't think he's embarrassed by that. Throughout Judges 4 and 5, you see no record of him being embarrassed that he's not the one to do it. Instead, we see a man who said, if God's there and you're there, let's do it. I love that faith. Now, as you look through this story, it, you really see that Deborah is the one in control. She's the one calling how everything's going to go. She said, okay. You're going to gather the 10,000 men. We're going up to Mount Tabor. Now, that's a very strategic thing that they're doing there, going up the mountain. Again, they're going in a battle against 900 iron chariots. Iron chariots have to go up the hill. In chapter 5, it's actually mentioned that it was raining. Yeah, this was planned very well. When they're up there, we can drop down to verse 14. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thy hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. Okay. Deborah said it's, this is the moment. No question. Okay, let's go. Let's do this. Let's engage in God's plan. Again, it's looked at as weakness in our eyes sometimes, saying, well, how is he the leader? How is he commanding this army if Deborah is making all the decisions? Well, it's very common for someone else to be making the decisions instead of the person in charge. The kings had their consuls. We don't look at them as weak for that. We don't look at Samuel going to tell Saul how to handle things says weakness on Saul's part. Saul had his own issues. But we're not looking at it like, well, you're relying on Samuel as an issue. No. It's a good move. You think of someone like Rehoboam, who if he listened to the good counsel, wouldn't have been in the situation he was in where he lost half his kingdom. He listened to the wrong counsel, but he had counsel. All these kings had counsels. When you have someone in charge, you want them to have a group of people around them giving them information and opinions. You don't want yes men all the time. It's not a good idea. Could you imagine, we'll use Pastor as an example, not he, that he would ever do this, but if Pastor just had the idea, you know what? I think we're just going to you know, build an add-on to the church. We don't need it, but I'm going to build it. And everyone's just like, yep, sounds good. No, no one has any opinions. There's a reason we have church meetings for decisions here. Not even a pastor should have all the control because this is God's church. The pastor was appointed here. And who appointed him? The congregation. God called and appointed by the congregation. No one should make all the decisions and not have counsel, especially godly counsel. 
There is not a single time where you're going to go wrong getting with a group of people praying for God's wisdom and direction. You're not going to go wrong finding God's will and asking other godly people, what do you think about this? So again, I don't, I don't see that as weakness. I don't look at him thinking, oh man, can't make his own decisions. I see a true leader. I see a man who knows what he's doing. And more importantly, I see a man who is humble. I see a humbleness in him. Because like I said, here's a man just saying, yep, this woman's in charge. She said we're doing this. Let's do it. I know, I know she's in God's will. I trust it. I don't need to be the leader. I don't need to be the one everyone looks to. Let's go for it. When you get into chapter 5 and you got the song of Deborah and Barak, that entire song points to God for all the glory. Who won this battle? God won this battle. He used us, but God won this battle. That's where it belongs. That's a humbleness. That he had no pride in himself when he won this battle. And he won this battle. Let's look at how this battle went. We'll start in verse, eh, we'll, we'll start in 14. We'll, we'll read that again. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomforted Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. He sent this man running. This man who had chariots, who had a trained army, went running. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harosheth of the Gentiles. And that's not no short jog. That's a distance there. If you, you look that up, there's a, quite the distance there. It's not just went down the mountain and that's it. He pursued them. And he fell, and all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. That entire army, well-trained army, fell. That's a complete victory. Now, it said Sisera fled away, and again, this had to, this had to be. God, God made it clear. You weren't going to be the one who kills him, but you are the one who won that battle. That battle is all him through Deborah, through God. But you know how it goes. Who gets the glory? The person who does the last thing, right? The, that final step is the one who's going to get all the glory for a work project, right? You, you send it to a boss. Hey, look this over. And the boss sends it out saying, look, this is the project we worked on, right? That's how it goes. but there's nothing wrong with God being the one getting the glory there. There's nothing wrong with God's people sharing the glory of something that God did for us. This was a complete victory. This was done. And like I said, people wonder why he's the one mentioned in the Hall of Faith. Deborah is honestly when you go through this whole chapter and you go through chapter 5, you, you really come away with Deborah as being one of the greatest judges. She is not painted in a negative light whatsoever. She had wisdom. People came to her for questions. She was appointed by God to be a judge for the people. She, makes the, she is pretty much the one singing that praise song in chapter 5. Not a single negative thing is mentioned about her. You really just come away saying, wow, that, that was a great woman of faith. Did she need to be in the hall of faith for anyone to realize that she had a great faith? No. She, she was perfectly fine where she was. But why is Barak there? Why is this man who just got told what to do, the one with a great faith? I don't know. I see a great faith here. I see a man who had no doubts what he was doing. 
Uh, a man who knew if God was with him, he was fine. And I don't even see any jealousy in this. Chapter 4, chapter 5, I see no discomfort in his position. Now the song in chapter 5, I, I kind of find hilarious because he's just kind of briefly mentioned. I, I mean, the song starts off with praising the Lord, praising the Lord. And the Lord brought up Deborah. The, the Lord used Deborah and Barak. And Deborah and these other people and Barak. He comes off as such a side note in the song. But you know what? He's still important. He's still there. He's still name dropped in the Bible. There are lots of people of faith who are not name dropped in the Bible. Some of them are just like a devout servant of the Lord, a priest of the Lord, a disciple of the Lord. Sometimes you don't even get a name, but you're still mentioned in the Bible. Is that, would that be good enough for you just to be mentioned in the Bible in any possible way in a positive light? There are some people mentioned in a negative light who probably wish they weren't in the Bible. But this, he's mentioned in a positive light. Would you have any problem with that? If in the book of Revelations, your church was added, and God's talking about, well, this, is, this church is good at this, and you were name dropped there, would you have any issue with that? I would love that. You could say, Carlos was here every service, and that's all you mentioned about me? I'm thankful that I'm even mentioned in that. I'm thankful that can be attributed to me. Faithful. I got no problem with that. Amen. Carlos took directions very well. Thank you. Thank you for calling me a good servant. There, there's no problem with, with his position here. There's no problem being told, you are a good servant, you are a good leader because you followed God's will. Nothing wrong with that. But like I said, he wasn't the one who killed Sisera. Verse 21, Judges 4, 21, this is where you find out what happens. Actually, let's go back a couple of verses. We'll go to verse 18. Jael went out to meet Sisera. This is where Sisera's running away. He's looking for where can I hide? How can I escape the situation? And, he said, and she said unto him, Turn in, my lord, and turn in to me. Fear not. And when he had turned into her unto the tent, she covered him with a mantle. So he, he thinks he's safe here because his, they have peace with her family. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a, a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Isn't that a little odd there? Did you ever see that? He asked for water, she gave him milk. Seems a little odd, right? Now, warm milk is actually something that's usually given to someone to help him go to sleep. And we see he, 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 he goes to sleep here. So it's not just like, oh, well, he asked for this, and she's just like, I don't want to give him what he wants. I gave him milk. No, there, there's a reason behind this. And opened the bottle, gave him drink, and covered him. He even covered him. Again, he said unto her, stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, is there any man here that thou shalt say no? He's feeling real safe. He's ready to go to sleep. And Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto the temple and smote the nail into his temples and fastened into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, and that's how he died. With a stake going through his head. Now, if there's something you want to take out of this, it means women know how to put up the tent. So next time we go camping, all the women are putting up the tents, okay? That's clearly what we see here. But you see this. He, he died in such a pathetic way, and yet people think that Barak is the one who should be ashamed of how this went down. I don't think so. I don't know why anyone feels Barak would be ashamed of this. When, when Barak comes and finds out about this, it doesn't say he's upset. 
Verse 22, And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nails in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. There was no, how did you take this from me? Nope. Okay, let's continue. Let's finish this. Let's get our people out of captivity. Who has time to be jealous that someone else finished the job? No. Let's move on. Let's continue to do what God wants. That's what I see here. Barak is someone who I feel deserves to be in that hall of faith. Because I, when I'm doing these studies, when I'm looking at this stuff, I really try to put myself in their positions. And as I told you, I would not be comfortable saying, okay, you want me to go? I'm going. I'm going to get 10,000 people. We're going to go up this mountain. We're going to fight a well-trained army. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable being told, lead 10,000 people. I'm not comfortable being told, hey, you're going to be the one who helps deliver your people. And there's a lot to be scared of in that situation. I mean, it, sure, death is an option, right? But being tortured is w worse. It, it's not, not an easy thing to answer that kind of call. So when you really look at Barak, when you really look at, did he do what God wanted him to do? Does he have a faith that deserves to be in the hall of faith? Absolutely. One, God would have never made an error in putting him in the Hebrews 11. That, that's the first thing. There should never be any doubt of what he did. And two, I see a strong man who knew if God's with us, we will win. And he, he knows his history. He, he knows when God was around, battles were won. Should the battle of Jericho have ever been won? Not without the Lord, that's for sure. They were not going to get through that wall without the Lord. Should they have been able to escape Egypt? Not without the Lord. He knew. He trusted in the Lord. There's a humbleness and there's a trust. A trust that no matter what, God is in control. If God says it's going to be, that is how it's going to be. Again, that's a, that's a trust that's hard to have. I told you guys right now, okay, God called you. We're going to go over to Gaza. We're going to go help in that situation. That's God's will. Is your trust there? You say, let's go. God's in control here. Or is there a doubt there? Because we're human. It's a tough call to have. And yet, you know, there are missionaries who are in positions where they feel like that. They're going to go to Lebanon. They're going to go to Israel. They're going to go to China. And there has to be a trust that God knows what he is doing. You have to have a trust like Barak. You have to have a humbleness knowing that you are not the main character. You are not the one in control. God is. I can learn a lot from Barak. I can learn how to accept not being the one in control. I can learn to be humble and know if God says this is how we're doing it, we're doing it that way. Again, being mentioned in the Hall of Faith chapter is already such a great achievement. There's a reason we call it the Hall of Faith. We look at every single name in there and say, serve the Lord, serve the Lord, serve the Lord. Barak belongs there. And if we're following that example, I would love to see all of us who would be considered in the hall of faith? 
You don't have to be mentioned in the Bible, but you can be considered a faithful servant of the Lord. You could be told, well done, thou good and faithful servant. When the end has come, when we are meeting the Lord, will we be mentioned as having a faith, a humility, and a trust in the Lord, quite like Barak had? I hope we all do. Let's pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this example I see, Lord. Thank you for showing that any one that you choose, Lord, from any standing, any one of us, Lord, if we are your child, if we're your child, Lord, we know you are in control, Lord. And Lord, we see how well you can use us. Lord, I thank you for Barak's example. I thank you that we can see this. And Lord, I ask that you help us all to replicate that, Lord. Help us all to bring honor and glory to you and not ourselves, Lord. Help us all to have a trust that if you're in it, it is the right thing and it will be done your way, Lord. Help us all just to have a faith that can be considered a wonderful servant of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll stand. Mm -hmm.